Nita Couchman. I am the president of the Orcas Island Garden Club. Um, I just want to welcome all of you to our program today. I know that it's going to be really interesting and fascinating, and we're excited to, uh, to hear Jen's story. So I'll turn it over to Dixie for her welcome. Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. I do know a number of our Garden Club members said that they are going to take full advantage of the beautiful day and really get out there and plant things. So welcome from wherever all of you are. Again, thanks for joining us. Now we want to launch right into our program to give as much time as we possibly can to our speaker. And I'll talk to you at the end of the program. I'm Lena Symes and I chair the program committee for Orcas Island. And I'm just um, really delighted to have Jenny talking again with us. And I say again, because she spoke to us when we were still meeting in person in those days that we remember with fondness. Um, I want to start with a little bit of housekeeping for the best listening and viewing experience during the presentation. Please keep your mic muted, turn off your personal video and select speaker view and you'll get that. Use the chat feature to submit comments or questions. Um, Carol DePogny, who's our librarian who helps with these make really makes these presentations possible, um, will monitor chat and organize the questions and comments that you submit. And now I'm just delighted to in, introduce you, Jenny. Jenny is a gardener, a horticulturalist and a plant designer. She's been working with plants, gardens and the people who care for them in the San Juans since the 1990s. She, um, is interested in planting site appropriate and climate resilient plants in ethical garden maintenance, ecological and naturalistic design and nurturing the biodiversity gardens can support. Teaching gardening and spreading the love of plants and knowledge about them and gain from them is her favorite role. Jenny. Thank you, Lena. Should I just share my screen? Is that what I do now? Yes, please. Oh dear. Lovely. All right. Um, thank you for having me. And I, um, I have to say that this garden and, and then the interest in it and this presentation have been just a, 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 a mind blowing experience for me. I think as we've all changed during this time, I too, I was questioning my, I was questioning my work. I was questioning my approach to gardening. I mean, I've done this many times in my, my gardening life, but this garden came to me at a moment when I, I needed it most. And I, I think a lot of people did. So that's the background and the, it's a personal background. It was an opportunity that I didn't see coming. It was um, an absolute dream and it's a work in progress. What you're going to see today and hear is, 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 is the beginning of this garden. It's certainly not done. I don't think any garden is, um, but it's been, it's been a real treat and we've been surprised and uh, it's, it needs work but you'll see, you'll see what's happening. Um, it came about because Jennifer Armstrong, director of the Family Resource Center here in Friday Harbor had become aware of my approach to gardening and um, they greatly expanded the building uh, to offer more services to our, our, our people here that need the most help. And she wanted a garden around the building that was immersive, that was joyful, that was full of life. And together we came up with this plan. We wanted to create beauty and awareness of beauty, awareness of insects and animals and transitions and the cycles of life and engagement. So that is, that is the amazing gift that, that I was given as a planting person by Jennifer and her board. So I'll walk you through what happened. One of the things that I thought about um, was sort of encapsulated by Leslie Bennett. Leslie Bennett is a, a garden designer in California. She does edible gardening, edible landscapes. 
And she said this beautiful thing, which is just one way of saying what we were trying to explore. Um, gardens are places where we connect and gather strength from nature and each other in order to face the painful responsibilities that come with being a human being. And to me, that said a lot. And one of those painful responsibilities that I felt was the impact on land, fossil fuel use, plastic consumption, all those things. Um, I think about every time I'm in a garden and, and working. Um, so this was something I wanted to carry with me. This is what it looked like in the front. It's a very small garden. Um, I can't remember the square footage, but it's, it's no more than 2000 square feet. And it was just grass kind of beaten down lawn um, with some overgrown viburnum tinus and forsythia and honeysuckles that were growing in front of the windows and badly trimmed crab apples that needed to be released. They were suffering. The grass, of course, was a complete dead zone. So we fiddled around with some ideas. If I can collapse that, yes. Um, so this is just more of saying what I was saying before. We wanted the joyful engagement, a changeable garden, plant plants and, and shelter for small creatures, an awareness and celebration of historic uh, indigenous cultures and animals and plants and, and also our immigrant cultures. Somebody is not muted. Um, we wanted a garden that allows people to experience the seasons and life and death and seed and renewal and a riotous planting of flowers and all that comes along with it. So, uh oh. There's sort of beginning sketches. Sketches for me are just playing around. It never really happens the way I draw them, but that was to place a way to sort of experiment. The process is where it happens, the on the ground stuff. So this site, which was mostly just grass, um, I would have preferred to keep that sod uh, on site and reused it in some way in a composting or a berm or something like that. But it was expeditious to, to calculate or, or consider the, the fuel, the diesel that would be required with these machines to take it away. Um, and that's what I decided to do. To these excavators are pretty fuel efficient and the sod was taken about two miles away and it was composted and reused in a soil mix that my friend Forrest makes. Um, he and his crew donated all their time to do this in one Saturday. Um, so his kids were there and his employees and a whole bunch of volunteers. We took away this, the sod, we dug the edges out, we, lay, we got sand, we planted bare root plugs, we laid down gravel and we sowed seeds. So that was the process and I'll walk you through it here with photographs. This is the, after the sod was taken away, mainly we left it under well, an established uh, sort of rootstock pair that's that's the one of the last remnants of an orchard, old orchard from this part of town. You'll see we we mulched that out instead of um, I felt it would be damaging to the tree to use the excavator underneath it. Then we laid down sand, 12 yards of, of local sand. This was from a big sand pit that Forrest found when he was digging a, digging a pond. So it was important to me to use local materials. So this sand came from near Roach Harbor. So there was considerable traveling back and forth, but um, wasn't coming from off island. Uh, we had to, in the back of the garden, which is this picture here on the lower right, um, we did not use machines. I mean, we did not use big machines. We did rototill um, this patch of grass that had just recently germinated. So that was an area that was higher in fertility than I wish. I, my goal was to 
one of the goals by taking away the sod is to reduce fertility. I, I wanted a low fertility um, situation. I did not want to amend it. I wanted it, the plants to struggle. So about two to six, two to 12 inches of sand was spread across the, the whole site. It depended on uh, the depth varied. Had a lot of amazing people helping dig the edges out, and that was a huge quack grass patch that um, had to be uh, thought through. And this is a little bit more about what I would be on to say, which is my my thoughts about fossil fuel use and plastic, um, and and labor for that matter. So. I like to think through these things, like what's the impact of this machine in terms of air quality, fuel extraction and plastic consumption and transport and all those things. So that's always in my mind and I feel like it has to be more in our mind, everyone's mind. Um, I, I had the opportunity to use bare root plants because of the season and it just made it made an amazing an amazing impact. We planted well over two thousand plants, and I ended up with fewer than fifty plastic pots, many of which were repurposed beforehand and repurposed afterwards. That, to me, is probably the biggest win of this entire project. The plants came from Bellingham; they were packaged in paper and sawdust, and came in the mail. So it was just amazing. We would prefer to keep all of our trimmings on site as, as, as yet we don't have that capacity, but I hope to be able to. Um, and I also will enjoy this conversation that maintenance work, this is beyond this garden, that maintenance in a garden, tending a garden, being a gardener, I believe should be thought of as a value not as an expense. And I, I'm, I'm sad and sadder that low maintenance gardening is, is, is something that people talk about. And I, to me, that just accentuates the disconnection that we have with our garden. And it's, it's just something I'm throwing out there is when I hear low maintenance, I hear a big problem, a big societal and cultural problem. And also, you know, what tidy means or what maintenance means. So that's something we're exploring. Um, the, other, the other amazing thing, it, it offered me a palette to try to, to, to experiment with planting less common Pacific Northwest native perennials and West Coast. Some of them popped over the mountains from the east side to to emulate um, the popular, you know, sort of prairie planting designs that a lot of people are doing mainly in Europe, but starting to be in this country. And many of those plants are Midwestern. Um, and I thought, could we not see if Pacific, Pacific Northwest or West Coast perennials could do the same thing? And um, I think so far we show that many of them can. So it's exciting to keep going with this. This is what, what I call a log wave. One of my, my great inspirations uh, mentors is Nigel Dunnett, and he's certainly not the only one who does this, but he talks about it a lot. And their log piles or log waves or dead hedges, uh, whatever you want to call them. And they provide, they slowly rot down, they provide uh, sheltering places for insects and vertebrates, possibly even birds, certainly plants. And um, we wanted to incorporate this as a way to show how rotting material in a garden is a benefit. Another picture of this sand going down, we left, tried to leave a, a clean gravel edge for, keep the sand and gravel off the path. This, this is what we did under the pear tree. I did the cardboard and mulch thing. I, I have mixed feelings about it. Um, 
but it worked really, really well in this in this situation, especially because I don't think we'll be planting under that tree. Um, I think over time it will be an incredible boon to the the whole the tree's health um, and provide a place to sit. This is for looking at later, but this is a list of the bare root perennials that went in. There were 1800 of these plants. Um, all came, those are the ones I said came in paper bags. So this you could look at later for uh, reference. This is what they look like. This is what they look like going in in November. They're mostly dormant. Um, it's a leap of faith to plant these little guys in the ground in basically pure sand. Uh, and I'm gonna answer the, the sand question now because I get that a lot. Why sand? Why gravel? Why did you not cultivate? Why did you not amend? Um, and those questions are good questions. Amendment, unnecessary. I think more and more we're becoming aware of the fact that our ideas of fertility and, and friability and fertility in a garden are, are kind of rooted in food growing and, and it's completely appropriate in food growing, at least it can be. And these plants are not plants that need, need amendments or need a you know, perfect seed bed or a perfect, perfectly cultivated, perfectly clean situation. They did go into a clean situation because the sand is, but they don't need fertilizer. So that's why we didn't amend. And that's why I took away this, the sod um, and didn't cultivate underneath. So then why sand? Why sand is, I knew it would be seed free and that was important to me. It's warm. It's also uh, moist. It holds moisture incredibly well. It's friable. So in that top layer, those, those roots are going to be able to, to really go. And then gravel goes on top. And why gravel? The same reasons. It's just bigger sand. It's clean. It holds moisture. It also is warm. And seeds loved to germinate in gravel. And I was going to overseed with native um, annuals and perennials. It's also clean and it's, you know, it's very clean looking. Problem is I'm gonna to wanna to keep it clean. So when you cut down this garden and when leaves fall, I think what's, that probably is going to be one of the bigger questions going forward is how to keep that clean so that I don't get a lot of other things germinating. and I. I don't want a layer of soil to be made on top of the sand and gravel, but we'll see. As I said, it's a work in progress. This is what it's looking like. This is November. On the left side, November, that's a big load of gravel there. We had a big work party moving all that gravel. Some of you hearing, listening today were there and that was a, an enormous help. So grateful to the volunteers. This is what it looked like for most of the winter. This section, which is the, the, the front of the building facing Market Street is 99% native. I did put in some non-native bulbs and a couple of non-native plants, but mainly native. And it's a contrived meadow. I call it a meadow or a prairie, but these plants wouldn't have occurred naturally together. Like, the grindelia and the sea thrift, you wouldn't necessarily see them growing with uh, the goldenrod or the sedum, maybe, but none of, all of these things wouldn't have occurred in nature together. So it's a contrivance, but I was, I was clear about that. It's a way to see if we can create a garden that has many, many months of interest. More sand pictures back here. This is behind the building is a mixture. This is where I was bringing the, the cultures together, so to speak. I was blending Mediterranean shrubs that we often, um, perennials that we all grow that are typically grown in homesteads like yarrow and 
uh, sage and things like that. Um, more has to be in, put in, but this was a combination garden. Some of them came in takeout containers. This is Campanula retundifolia, which has been a huge success. More pictures of the baby plants. These are these are tall. These are um, deep plugs, ten centimeter plugs that I got from a, a nursery in Eastern Washington. I was excited about their selection because I knew that some of their some of the buckwheats and artemisias from the east side would probably grow well here, and they have proved to be so. The sand every morning was a great window onto who visited it. And before the gravel went down, it was completely peppered with r raccoons and deer. And um, it was interesting to see what happened. The seeds went in after the pea gravel and the, and the one inch drain rock. So the gravel topping was pea gravel and a one inch round drain rock. Both of those products came from off island. That is the concession I, I had to make because we don't have gravel from a quarry on San Juan or any island in the county that would work in the same way, in the work in the way I wished it to work. So that was imported. These are the seeds. These came from Northwest Meadowscapes. Um, really awesome company in um, on Whidbey. I recommend them. I think there's some spelling errors on here. I'm very sorry. We planted bulbs on the left is just regular snakes head fritillary. I couldn't at the time find a source of our local chocolate lily, but I hope to. On the right top is Circium brevistylum, which is our native um, biennial thistle. I, uh, you'll see pictures of that later. On the bottom is a, is a log pile that um, I haven't finished. These are pine, short pine rounds that I like the look of, but they rotted away and I had to take them away, sadly. But when I took them away, I found what I had hoped to find, which was a whole nest of leafcutter bee um, capsules. I'm not sure what you call them, but when they make their little capsules with the, with the leaves, I found them under there and I had to relocate them sadly, but within a few months, the insects were using the gravel and the wood in the way I had hoped. Some small narcissus, this is also a nod to what traditional homestead gardens might have. Camas, we have both kinds. Um, great success, the deer love it. So I, I insisted on spraying them with plant skid, which worked really well. Um, I just wanted to get them up and blooming. I, I don't know what will happen in the future, but they've eaten nothing else. This is when it's beginning to flower, this is May. Right hand bottom is um, the very first beginning to see uh, bees making nests in the sand, the sand and gravel. That was the other big reason is to provide uh, habitat for um, ground nesting bees. And they came in the thousands and it was incredible to watch. I even left a big patch unplanted and it was full of nests. It was just so rewarding. There they are, those are the leaf cutter bee eggs. And that's where she got her material, which is a service berry about 20 feet away. This, these days just made, made it all worth it for me. The, the seeds, I sowed them late. I was, I was late and I'm late again this year, but um, Many of them worked really well, among them Clarkia. We had some kids from Spring Street science class come and, and do some sketching and do a little journaling one day. And one of them found this. 
front starting to really fill in this point must be May or June. The, the uh, Grindelia, the, the plant on the top right, the gumweed, which you might know grows along the seaside, um, inland, which is very far, but inland, it was a monster. It was three feet tall and just uh, amazing. And I, if it comes back, I'm going to cut it in May this time so that it doesn't grow so tall and um, fall over. But it was amazing to watch the insects on it. It was, it was just covered and people would stop and just gaze at this plant, this gummy plant full of insects. And that too was, it just made, it just made my day watching these young children touching this plant and engaging with these insects. It was just uh, so powerful. Bottom right is Erigeron glaucus, the sea, the beach daisy, I think, and the seeds. Um, I'm a great lover of seed heads, and you'll see a lot more photographs of them. I, I, I just if I have one thing to do in my life, it's to encourage people to look at seeds and the forming seed heads as exquisitely beautiful things. And, and they're not just that, they're actually more alive in a way than the, the plant itself. They're full of life. Clarkia. Immersive, we wanted this garden to be as immersive as possible. It, it could be that we put paths through it as time goes on, I, I hope to. Clarkia and Colomia, wonderful annuals that are absolutely worth growing and they were not eaten at all, n n not at all. And I know the deer pass through. Now here is my my renegade self coming out. So this is Circium brevostylum. I salvaged these as seedlings from a piece of land where they're not appreciated. And um, my hope was that they would do this. This plant is stunning. It is not particularly thorny. It's scary, I know, but it's full of beautiful things. And one of those is nectar. It was incredibly popular. And then when it reached that stage on the lower right, what I'd hoped to happen did, and that was the goldfinches came in absolute hordes and they would hang and feed on this plant. And there were three others. One was right outside somebody's office. And she said she would look outside and see goldfinches hanging upside down eating seeds. And I, I don't know what else the goldfinches are eating in town but I had never seen any before. Leaf cutter bees loved the Grindelia. You can see one there. Honey bees. And then I, I wanna point this out. One of the things I love is seed heads, as I said, and on the, on the right with the bee is the, is the full on flower. On the left is one that's been pollinated and it's starting to change and it's starting to curl and change that to that color and it will carry on as you'll see here eventually being a beautiful russet color same thing happening here this is douglas aster and on the lower right middle is what happens to those ray flowers they start to curl and they turn into that gorgeous caramel color that's what i wish and if it takes photographs that's okay. And then I encourage people to go out and look at them and not cut them down. This plant has been a huge success. I had not grown it before, seen them or again them. Um, far more vigorous initially than, than our regular, the one we normally see, see them spathulifolium, but um, definitely going to plant more of this. It's very bright and green and perky. Classic uh, late summer combination of goldenrod and Douglas Aster. Uh, if there's only two plants you can plant in a nice big blousy border native plants, then I would, you know, I would encourage these. 
they're tall, they're rambunctious, but spectacular. We sowed um, yarrow. Um, we didn't plant any plants. We sowed from seed and, and they, many of them grew vigorously and flowered in the first year. More little bee homes. Pearly Everlasting in the background with the Douglas Astor and a friend. Bad photograph, but these are um, these are things that I sowed from seeds. So that's a woolly, woolly sunflower, Oregon sunshine, Ariophyllum, and yarrow, doing really well in dry, dry conditions from seed. This was a particularly hard area, total hard pan under about three inches of sand. Meadow sedge, uh, Carex pansa, was a great has turned out to be a wonderful thing in a dry, meadowy situation, um, very successful. Douglas Astor starting to go into the poofy stage. So wildlife, as much as I was determined to make this garden for creatures, I hadn't foreseen that the raccoons would want to eat bee pupa. So I came one day and in this whole section that I left open for the, the ground nesting bees, which was full of them, I came in and they had been foraged on. And I and this was a challenging moment because, you know, it's like all those things I carry, like, oh, it's mess, messed up my garden or it's eaten these baby bees or you know, what a pain and thought, no, you know, I can't be selective. I can't say yes, bees, no raccoons. So um, it'll be interesting how this happens. So we're feeding raccoons too, and that's okay. Here's the Grindelia going more coppery and russety. Gary Oak, which was a donation from a master gardener. It's very small. I'm hoping that it really roots down and becomes a, an amazing thing and lives for hundreds of years. If we look at yarrow closely, we can see how absolutely exquisite it is. This is a partial list of the other plants that were planted in the garden. Most of these were containers. Some of these were divisions. Buckwheats are a great favorite of mine and I um, rare, you rarely see them growing up here, um, mostly in California and east of the mountains. And they are something we need to grow more of if you have a dry, a site that's not super wet in the winter they are um, just exquisite plants. This one did especially well, Ariogonum nivium, so-called snow buckwheat. Here's just a picture of some of the alliums with a back gauzy veil of Dysjampsia cespitosa, our native um, hair grass, is that right? Which mostly died in the heat dome, but they're beautiful dead too. This is a list of the bulbs we planted. Douglas Aster, you'll see a lot of Douglas Aster. I just adore them. They're starting to go into the, more into the seed phase. Uh, Monardella odoratissima on the left, lower left, right, on the left, sorry. Um, also a wonderful uh, dry sort of some shrub um, that we, we could and should grow more of. Camas seed heads, baby clarkia. Douglas Astor and this is my, uh, my combined garden. That's Flomus, uh, Jerusalem sage, but a different one called monocephala. 
nice color. Seaside daisy, late, late, later in the season, starting to get kind of scruffy. Gallardia did not like the transplanting. I had a two week uh, wait between the arrival of the bare root plants and planting because we had a drainage issue. Um, and some of them didn't like it, the, none of the native flaxes lived. Some, most of these died, but there seem to be babies coming. So it's a, it's a great plant. I'm sure you all know it, blanket flower. Now here's some shots of the back garden, which I just let, I let things that were there stay, such as the uh, salsify. Um, I sowed poppies. Uh, planted a bunch of salvage things from people's gardens. And it, it was a, a very popular space because it was very colorful. And, but I've intertwined, there's a madrone in there and flowering current and a lot of the native perennials are spread back into that. So it's a kind of a mixture. It's very pretty and I'm, I'm happy to provide pretty as long as it makes sense ecologically in terms of water use and uh, insects benefit, etc. This is the back as it's starting to go into that beautiful autumn color. This is the front. This must be October. Um, the Grindelia, which is the main event, is starting to sort of fall over and go brown. I planted Rebecca occidentalis, which is, um, you know, Rebecca is our black eyed Susans. This plant is native to the West here, and it has no ray flowers, it's just a brown cone. And for that reason, I think people don't plant it, but it is very cool. And it makes these lovely chocolatey brown seeds. Fireweed, I adore fireweed and I love this shape. Um, and of course the fluff. Sorry for the fuzzy photos, but this is uh, Andropogon. It's big, big blue stem, which is a prairie grass that extends into our region east of the mountains. It has a lovely color. Behind is Santolina. So this is in the mixed part of the garden. I'm thinking of uh, herbs, herby, herby sorts of plants that are tidy and kind of. Uh, traditional along with this, which this grass laying across the top is uh, Indian rice grass, Acnatherum. I, I think it's changed its name, um, but it's been so exciting to grow. I will show more pictures of it, more asters. Penston and David Sonii is a, I believe a, an alpine, at least a Cascades, Penstemon doesn't bloom very much, but it's very, very sweet, very nice little green creeping on the ground. This old fluff stuck on a flowering current. Bribes divericatum, this is the black gooseberry, it grows uh, here on this island. And I love, I love thorns. I love how they are. I love what they are. And these I think are especially beautiful. And I think of thorns uh, as a great metaphor for protecting yourself. There's that again. Colomia in senescence. It's a wonderful color, flinging seeds everywhere. More babies. 
things in decline. Another close up of seeds. This is a uh, goldenrod and uh, it's just one more, one more nudge to get people to not cut them down. It's um, one, they're beautiful. Two, they're feeding creatures all winter long with seeds and who knows what else. And they're just exquisite. There's a grass tucked in there that's very cool. It's a wintery, a cool season grass called Mullenbergia emerslii. Um, a lot of native grasses are worth looking into. Buckwheat and asters. Buckwheat and dead, this camp, just jampsia in the back. Heat dome was a problem. There's the Indian rice grass. If you look in the very center of this photo, you can see a good image of the little fuzzy seeds that are coming out of the, the appendages on the seed. I'm not sure what they would call that um, on, the, on the rice grass seed. Uh, just gorgeous thing, very hard to photograph. Um, but the next phase with this plant would be to um, grow enough of it to, to actually collect it and, and cook it the way it, indigenous folks do. Another close up that we don't often notice, and this is Grindelia in the fall. It's winter, actually, this was December, it starts to take on this amazing color. And aster seeds. Who couldn't see that was beautiful. And very popular with birds. Indian rice grass again in the background is um, Artemisia tridentata, mountains, mountain big sage or big mountain sage. If you go to the garden, seek it out and touch it and um, smell your hands. It is an amazing experience. Cool season grasses looking good in December. Fungal decay on uh, verbascum. I plant verbascums. I know that they're questionable, but um, this one has not, in my experience, ever been a, a problem. It's a white one. And I left this up. And I think that fungal diseases and decay on plants in the garden is okay. And I think of it as a teaching time. I know that this fungus is not going to infect anybody else. It's sort of interesting, it's reality. And I left it until I felt that it may be possibly impacting the, the recovery of the plant at the bottom, or I wanted it to grow again. But um, I know I'm strange, but I think it's important, especially in a garden that is, in my view, a garden to not just sort of put band-aids on things, but to show everything, beauty, you know, abundance, joy, and then the rest, because it's all gonna come back again. Rus, Rus Typhina, trash. There's a lot of trash in the garden. Um, it kind of blows in from the road. You can imagine the main trash item was uh, masks. Um, then, you know, we need to spend a little more time cleaning. Seedlings. On the left is a seedling uh, heuchera um, that obviously came from one of the, one of the bare root plants that we planted. And uh, Viola on the right. I don't know who the other little ones are, but um, soon we'll know. More color. This is dead just champsy again. And I think that that, that color, I left it because it, it's interesting and it's a moment in time. Plants are ephemeral, gardens too. Heat dome casualty, the heucheras, some of them did not survive. And that brings up the question of irrigation. I did not intend to irrigate this garden at all, um, but last summer pushed me over 
because it was so unusually hot. And it was a lot of time and money put in this garden. And I, 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 Jennifer and I together decided that we had to water. We couldn't afford to lose them. And if it's just this last summer, then that's great. Uh, we didn't water very much, but we watered enough to uh, calm our anxiety down. And um, we didn't lose very many at all. The dyschampsia, as I said, did not like it. And a few of these, but nothing else. Everything else, especially the east side stuff, the California stuff, absolutely powered through without a wink. Another late summer, fall picture of the front. This front garden was, was very uh, attractive to people. And I would, I would work there on Sundays when nobody was around. And um, every single time somebody stopped, turned around, ran across the street to tell me how much they loved it and wanting to know what it was and what this was and how they could have it themselves and who I was and why did we do this and what's this and what's that. And um, it was, the reception has been tremendous. It's been challenged in the winter. Um, these are babies. I think we have hundreds of thousands of seedlings in it right now. The winter uh, towards the end, towards the end of the year, beginning of this year, the um, the garden was challenging for some people. It it looked dead and untidy and uncared for, and so we're starting now to to cut it down at least to, um, as, you know, do something towards making it look cared for. Um, my challenge now, though, is to put plants in that can endure in the winter and and soften that feeling of. Uh, in some people. Beach, beach strawberry uh, looks like this in the winter. How amazing. Goldenrod looks like this in December after the snow. Clarkia looks like this. These guys bloomed under the snow. That was under the snow too. That's uh, that beach daisy, Erigeron glaucus, along with oregano. This is the seed of the Grindelia at the very end of the year. So COVID of course impacted our plans for this garden too as many and uh what what's next is that we hope to, to 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 start going forward in our plans to engage the public in the garden in in lots of different ways we're not sure how it will play out but um teaching uh, kids programs craft programs collecting data i would like to get a biodiversity study going with some somebody a, a grad student or something like that um, perhaps collecting and sharing seeds from the garden um, and all kinds of things I don't even I haven't even thought of yet um, so that that is the next phase um, apart from adding more plants where there are holes and I welcome any ideas that anyone might have or any participation um, we really want this garden to be a place that people want to be in and learn from and change and affect and play in. So, and possibly we're spilling over out of this particular space into the Mullis Center uh, proper. That's uh, in consideration. This is what it looked like after the snow melt. And this is when it started to be struggling, but people started to struggle with how it looked. And um, so that's my big challenge now as to how to how to mitigate that. Part of it would be cutting the Grindelia. The Grindelia was so tall it fell over and I just left it. But now I realize that's probably not, not the best thing if I cut it short before it has a chance to fall over would be the better option. 
And um, that's just a little thing that we wrote a long time ago. What I really want you to see on this page is that picture of that is what's left of the very first flowering of Campanula rotundifolia, our native harebell. If you leave them, they become that. And they're tiny. They're, they're the size of a, I don't know, a pea. And they're absolutely exquisite. Um, so that's just one more thing that you can gain or change, you know, see, like just seeing differently. Um, if you think of your plants as something that has more than one season, more than flowering. And then this is just to take away if someone wanted to look at this later. These are questions that I have and I bring into my practice and my life and my friendships. And like, I want us to spend time thinking about what these words mean to ourselves personally in our relationships and our relationships with, with the garden and plants and land and animals. And why am I thinking these things? And, and why am I doing certain things? And do I have to do them that way? And so this is just a fun exercise if anyone wanted to do this. I would love to do this with people if anyone wanted to think of a way for us to have conversations about what, what messy is or what native is or what, what a garden is or what, what fears do I bring into this garden? So that's just something I had to toss in there because I'm kind of thinking about it. And this also felt relevant in this particular garden because of what that building houses. It houses a, a staff of people whose entire work is, is finding ways to, to care for other human beings in our community that need help and support. And I know that we cannot save this earth unless we take care of each other. And if people don't have their needs met, they're not gonna be able to help us or oh, I don't mean it like that. They're not gonna, who, who can save the planet if they can't save themselves? So this I think is such, a, such an important part of this garden. And if we can care for each other, then we're, we're together. And then all these people I have to thank and the, the donated materials, the donated time, donated care. And then that's a list of the the resources that we purchased. Uh, very grateful for all of it. And this is me, and I would be happy to discuss any of this with anybody, anytime. Um, I, I believe that this, this change in thinking about gardening and our relationship with other nature, meaning that nature is not separate from you and me and is, it's profoundly exciting and inspiring. And this little garden, challenging to some people, inspiring for others, is just one, one tiny thing that we can do. And I just, I would be so excited to help anybody who wanted to do something similar. So that's it. There were other things I was supposed to say. I don't know what they are, but um, there you are. Thank you. And I'm going to look at the chat now. Ah, are you still there? Hey, Jenny, I've collected the questions and grouped okay. them a little bit. Shall I just paste them? I'll paste them in one chat to you. And okay. that way you can just run through them. Just give me two okay. ticks. Yeah. And Would you put up your, again your native care garden list again? Yeah, you've so, asked, people have asked about your sources as the first couple of questions. Oh, yeah, okay. You mean like, oh, let's see. I can't look at the chat and do that at the same time. Oh, let's see. So can people see that? Uh-oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, this one? How do I make it bigger? This one? Uh, that was one of the questions. And someone asked, I also asked about the... Um, bulb planting list. Oh, um, I, this is a little bit beyond my capacity at the moment. Let's see. So I'm getting all messed up here. 
uh, uh, can you, the bulb list, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do the questions and then I have to, and what is the Bellingham source of the plants you ordered? This is Fourth Corner Nurseries. They are a wholesale grower for restoration products, pro projects, but they have a, a big minimum for um, the plants like I bought. Um, but they will, they will sell to anybody. Um, and if you email me directly, I can put you in touch with them and tell you how to do that. Um, I personally am hoping to do more of this and I, I would love to be organized enough to, to gather other people who want to, to share bare root orders um, uh, together. So far, I haven't been very successful with it, but um, I would very much like to make that happen. So email me directly, anyone who's interested in bare root perennials from Fourth Corner Nurseries and we'll make it happen. Um, can you talk about sources for native plants and seeds? So again, fourth corner nurseries for bare root perennials, uh, uh, plants of the wild. Uh, that's a wholesaler in Eastern Washington. They have a retail department called Thorn Creek, I believe. Um, seeds came from Northwest Meadowscapes on Whidbey Island excellent local seeds. There are, there are many others, but I just buy from them because they're so local. Why sand? Why amendment? No amendment at all. Amendment meaning fertility or compost or anything like that. No amendment at all. Why sand? I, I addressed that. I hope that person heard me. It's, it's weed-free. It's super drainage, but it holds moisture at the same time. It's warm. It's clean. Um, subsoil under the sand, it varied. It was mostly highly compacted from years of horrible lawn mowing and walking and death zone, which is what a lawn is. Um, and I did nothing to it. We scratched it a tiny bit in some places, but mostly not. Um, I'm counting on and it's proven true so far that the plants will root through that sand and be super happy and with soil microorganisms and, and the, the rooting of all these different plants at different levels, we will have a, a soil, uh, uh, the microbiology in the soil will be boosted and, and it will start to break up. Why are you worried about, were you worried about salt? No salt, I don't know. The sand did not come from, it, the sand came from inland, it's not salty. Um, if that was the question. Are the annual cell seeding? Absolutely. It is now covered in seedlings, which will be interesting to see what we might have to do, if anything. Um, will this stabilize? It might over time stabilize into a, a, a population of plants that are compatible. Um, I don't know. It is an experiment that way in terms of the cell see seeding. Uh, would it work to create a meadow like this in the middle of a regular backyard grassland or would it be seeded over with grass and thistle in a few years or consumed by deer? I can't answer that particularly well, except that I can say that establishing a meadow in the middle of a regular backyard grass is hard. And there's a great um, blog post on Northwest Meadowscapes um, website that talks about their method and it would probably work pretty well for you. I, I'm concerned about it because the seeds in the, in the, in the grass that you're killing are going to be there. That is why I use sand and I'm using sand because, um, uh, there are people in the world that I'm going to make myself trying to, go well, anyway, um, that are doing this a lot and, and you know, maybe it's consumptive, consuming consumptive to use sand, um, you know, to bring it in, but it's kind of near guarantee that I'm not going to have sand seeds in it. Um, would it be seeded over the grass and thistle in a few years? I think it would if you have grass and thistle blooming nearby. Um, 
consumed by deer entirely dependent on the species you choose. None of ours were eaten by deer. I don't know what this year will be like, but we had no trouble at all. Do you cut the three foot old branches of Gundelia, just leave them? We had to cut them and I always intended to cut that Gundelia down. I was just hoping to leave it a little bit longer. Had it been upright rather than lying down, I might've left it if I hadn't um, been encouraged to cut them due to uh, perceptions. Um, will you thin out the self-seeded seedlings? Um, I don't know quite possibly. It depends on who they're crowding out. If they're crowding out each other, probably not. If they're crowding out a perennial thing that I have special care about, probably. Interpretive signage, yes, that's scheduled. We, um, Master Gardener Foundation has given us money to buy um, plant signs and two interpretive signs. And so that's coming up this spring. Very important. And uh, trying to figure out what to say on a small sign, but it will have a QR code on it, which will take people, if they're that way, to a web page that describes what's going on. Uh, let's see, the bulb list, let me see it. And I'm, bulbs planted there. Good. Any other questions? Do you have different, do you have lists of plant associations for different zones? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't, you mean from this garden? Uh, I mean, different, different garden areas here. Oh, I could I could come up with that. You could email me and I could um, send that to you, Crow. Uh, not so random, but email me. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would love this to be recorded and um, and available to anybody, whatever I can do to help make that happen. Krista, um, no, did not water at all uh, because it was October, November and they were mostly going dormant at that time. They were, or they were going dormant. No, no watering at all until whatever happened in July <laughs> and whatever it was, June, July. Yeah, so no. Oh, and I will want one more thing about planting. Anything that had soil on it, anything that came in a pot, and there were very few things, everything was washed. No potting soil was put in that garden at all, ever. And that is very important, uh, very important thing. Potting soil is a problem for drought resistance. And I know, you know, people might disagree with me, but if you can take the soil off of all your plants and plant them directly where you want them to grow, you'll have better, you'll have better plants. Sand on old lawn, no, I would never put sand on grass. It would just grow right through and be happy. All, Diane, all the, all the grass was taken away, completely gone. I want to make myself appear. I can't figure out how. We we can see you. Oh, you um, can as a small, you know. Oh, as a small book. thing. Okay. Um, Jenny. Yeah. I'm I'm just sort of overwhelmed, and I know I'm going to be watching this again and again. Um, ah. Just. I'm ready to run over there, run outside, and scrape off the <laughs> the grass <laughs> and stuff. <laughs> And, and do all that. And I'm, you know, I keep thinking about the plants that were falling over and my reaction, which I suppose was odd too, was to think, yes, and um, was that those seemed like places where birds would seek refuge. Yes. I, I don't know if you have pictures of that or. But I, I, I don't, I wish I did. And I, um, 
I can see both sides. You know, I, 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 um, I would, I would have preferred them not to fall down. And, and I think if they were shorter, they still might, might provide that, uh, shelter but there were lots of other places but yes and i mean if if only that happens that someone thought about what benefit that dying plant lying down would offer then we're getting somewhere and that's that's exciting yeah so there are some more takeaways i'm hoping that in two years you'll come back and describe to us what maintenance actually was like yes right the maintenance fortunately the 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 resource center has a little money and I've got a, a young person who wishes to be involved and maybe there'll be others. Um, and so that's exciting. Uh, I'm going to answer Krista Campbell's question here. Uh, yes. uh, uh, Krista, we, we removed all the sod, everything and all the plants and then the sand, then planting, then gravel, then seeds. So it was sod removal. You could, you could do it this way. If you had time, you could kill the sod by covering it up and then put the sand and gra- sand plants, gravel seed. Um, I chose to take it away because I didn't want any more fertility in this site at all. And killing sod adds fertility to the ground. And I, I really wanted to take it away, but you could do that. Uh, so sod goes away or dies, sand, plants, gravel, seed. All right. Any more? And then Carol is saying thank you, which I think we all echo. Oh, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Really, thank you to the library and Carol and everybody. And, and I really mean it. I, my, my work practice is, is largely about communicating and, and sharing with people and um i would love to to explore all of this with others i don't know how but um you know somewhere i i don't do my instagram much but i i do appreciate it for that um i'm trying to write more on my website uh i haven't but i plan to but anybody has questions or or ideas to share or things to point out or whatever please be in touch with me somehow and and I will share more. I'll do it on my website as this garden um, changes. And please come and see it anytime. Let me know. And I'll meet you there. Lovely. And we're yeah. going to brainstorm about what we can do maybe about as a, as a club or as the two clubs about mm-hmm. um, those terms and about getting people together to think about them and stuff. So we'll probably be in back in touch with you about that great today i just i think all of us have so much that we're taking away to consider so many resources we will have information up we'll have the recording of the presentation plus we'll have your um um, slideshow so that people can go back to either of it um and see those lists that you've provided that are so helpful and the resources um i just Thank you so much. You're That's welcome. So I'm very yeah. grateful for the opportunity. And I, if I can help make gardens different in uh, any way, I, I'm, I'm there for it. Okay. okay, I think we're on to Dixie. Hello, everybody. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes. All righty. Wow. Thank you, Jenny. It was brilliant, <laughs> inspiring. And I'm also pondering your words and ideas and how to further take a look at, you know, what those words and ideas mean to us. Lots, I think. So I have three things to share before we close out. And I think that Jenny's going to be um, kind of really impressed with us Mm -hmm. because in March the 19th, Christina Pfeiffer is going to be speaking on um, creating a more drought resilient garden simple steps to helping gardens weather the drier seasons. You know, we're all really taking a look at our weathering changes. So that's on March the 19th. That's the second meeting for the garden clubs. Number two, on uh, Lopez, we are having a plant sale in concert with the school garden, May the 7th. Um, And more to come. So plant plant your seeds and get ready. I'm going to have you guys be really impressed. This is a a pizza box, non-plastic from um, 
Barn Owl Bakery. And we're gonna have a ton of those for you available. And this is hydroponically grown basil. Lots of those are gonna be at the Stevenson Egg, um, Egg House on the 19th and 20th, just for you to collect and, and enjoy. Um, and lastly, and again, thank you to the Stevenson family. Lastly, at the Lopez Island um, uh, Market in the garden uh, cabinet, we have all kinds of garden books for you given to us by the Noxious Swede Control Board. So that's gonna be right in the little slots by the garden club, um, by the um, uh, bulletin board. So again, thank you, lots to think about. And I think it's on to Nita now. Great, um, what a program this has been. I am just, um, I'm just, blown away. I'm inspired by Jennifer's enthusiasm for, for every stage of a plant's life, for her attention um, to the well-being of all the critters in the gardens, and also just um, the mindful, thoughtful approach to creating and enjoying a whole life garden. And um, gosh, there's just so much. We will be posting um, Jennifer's PowerPoint to the Orcas Island Garden Club website, along with the recording of this program, so that you'll be able to look back through her PowerPoint, print out particular slides with lists of plants um, that you're interested in, and uh, Jennifer's contact information, uh, her resources page for where to buy by plant. So we'll, um, we'll be posting all that um, information on the website. Um, the Orcas Garden Club wants you to mark your calendars for March 16th, where we will be hearing from Emily Ehring, who is a, an Orcas Island landscaper plant person. And she's going to be talking about gardening in San Juan County for healthier and happier people, plants, and land. So we are looking forward to that. And um, thank you, Jennifer, for today's program. Thank you, everyone, for coming and participating. And I hope you can go out and enjoy your gardens now. So thank you so much. We'll see you next month. Thank you.